Welcome to our audience tonight. Uh, we are here in San Diego at the ASH meeting, the 60th meeting of ASH, uh, and this is the IMWG conference series. Uh, and what we're going to focus on, as we have done so often in the past, is what are the best abstracts for ASH this year, and specifically, what are the takeaways as we uh, sit here uh, on Monday evening uh, coming to the close of ASH for 2018. I'm very, very pleased to be joined this evening uh, by our guest, uh, Mari B. Uh, Mateos uh, from the University of Salamanca in Spain, so welcome. Hello, And uh, jo Joseph McHale uh, from the uh, Translational Gen Genomics Research Institute uh, in Phoenix and also uh, Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. And so we're very, very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. McHale this evening. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and so, uh, as we start, I just want to be clear that we are thankful to our sponsors, uh, Celgene, Cariaform, and uh, Takeda Oncology. So thank you uh, for helping us to make this possible. So this year at ASH has been very impressive, 939 total myeloma abstracts this year. So a massive uh, number of presentations. Uh, among those, the orals and posters for the CAR T cells and related immunotherapies, a very, very uh, important uh, collection of abstracts. There are many, many uh, abstracts on important novel therapy combination updates and uh, we won't be able to cover uh, many of those. Also a lot of uh, uh, abstracts on molecular uh, and biology topics and we will just be able to touch on that uh, briefly this evening. And so, uh, what have uh, the topics that we have selected for tonight are, are six uh, different topics uh, and uh, bites uh, by specific T cell engagers. Uh, the first, the early data on that were presented uh, here at ASH. Uh, many, many abstracts on CAR T cells, as I mentioned. Uh, some uh, important data on frontline treatment options, uh, some uh, very helpful data about maintenance some new ideas about uh, blood monitoring, and also uh, some data that make us think about what is the role of MRD in the relapse setting. And I've also included uh, some uh, possibility for my guests to bring up any additional hot topics that they may have come across during these few days here in uh, San Diego. And so if we go to the first topic, um, this is what is the impact of these bi-specific antibodies, the bites. And this cartoon shows for everyone uh, what is involved. This en engagement of the T cell is uh, produced by the bi-specific antibody which uh, connects the T cell to the myeloma. And right now the commonest target is the BCMA on the myeloma which is engaging the T cell. And as you can see here in the cartoon, this triggers the release of a variety of uh, cytokines and the like, interleukin-2, 6, and also perforin and granzyme B. These that allow, uh, the, 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 the contribute to the death of the myeloma. So this is uh, uh, very, very important. And so here at ASH, uh, we had the early results, uh, the phase one, two results with the AMG420 bite, uh, and uh, this was presented here to show the impact of the different doses, uh, dose escalation. And what you can see in this first chart is that the higher doses, uh, 200, 400, 800 micrograms per day, which you can see at the bottom left, uh, the blue and the purple uh, indicating rather deep and sustained uh, cell reduction with these higher doses, so really quite uh, impressive results with these early data. And so uh, the AMG420, an anti-BCMA bite, uh, induces MRD negative CRs in this relapse refractory population. And so this initial study is from a, a Euro European team uh, led in this case by uh, Dr. Top from uh, uh, Wurzburg in, in Germany. And so the first question is, uh, are these uh, data encouraging? And, and what do we think about the future for this type of strategy using bites versus what we'll talk about in a moment, uh, the CAR T cell therapy? So 
So maybe, Maravi, you could comment first. How did this uh, set of data strike you with the, with the bites? I think that uh, the bites, uh, so these uh, monoclonal antibodies targeting both the plasma cells and at the same time the, the T cells, I think that are really very encouraging. So we had uh, the opportunity to see preliminary results uh, of the phase one trial, including, of course, a small subgroup of patients, relapsing on refractory myeloma, all of them had been previously treated with proteasome inhibitors and imid. Not all patients had been previously treated with monoclonal antibody, but most of them had received either daratumumab or ilotuzumab. Right. And uh, so different doses were evaluated. And uh, so as you mentioned, the maximum tolerated dose was 400 milligrams. And at that dose, I would say that almost all patients not only responded, but uh, achieved the complete response and minimal residual disease negative. Yes. It's true that so I think that we have to wait uh, to have longer follow-up because uh, we need uh, to know the duration of the response uh, and especially the median progression free survival. Mm -hmm. But so these uh, efficacy results I think that are encouraging and together with the safety profile because uh, so at uh, 800 milligrams so there, there was uh, a dose limiting toxicity. I think that uh, a neurological adverse event uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think that the toxicity profile is That's also good. acceptable. Acceptable. So we will see how these uh, new monoclonal antibodies, the bites monoclonal antibodies, will compete with the CAR T cells. Because yes. uh, so at the end, the bite is a monoclonal antibody that we can take from the pharmacy and we can yes. deliver immediately to the patient. Absolutely, off the shelf, as they say. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, and I actually think that's one of the critical pieces here. I mean, yeah. if we are trying to employ the patient's own immune system and now, as we understand the science behind T cells better and being able to engage them, um, that, that's a fantastic step forward. So having a different mechanism of action in of itself is critical. But in comparison to CAR T cell therapy, which I know we'll come to and is, is very encouraging, it's the access is an issue. It's not yes. even so much the cost. I mean, if we have difficulty getting access to a simple autologous stem cell transplant, being able to have a patient go through the apheresis and then the quality checks on it and then producing the T cells, uh, or producing the, the CAR Ts and then reinfusing the patient, that's, that's fairly involved and it'll right. work very well for a lot of patients, but there are a lot of patients who won't be able to get that. And this bite might be an opportunity to employ that method of engaging the T cell without having to go through all of that. As right. you said, so Brian, the off the shelf. Yeah, off, off the, the shelf, shelf simpler. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> okay, but, but obviously early days and we just have to see how this goes forward. But uh, uh, my sense is that uh, many people did seem to be quite encouraged and uh, we'll see how things work out. So It definitely packed the house. This yes. presentation was just barely over an hour ago yeah. and uh, there wasn't a seat left in the house yeah. to listen yes, to. Yes, everyone's pretty interested to yeah. see uh, these early results for sure. Uh, and and uh, at this meeting, uh, we have uh, more mature data with, with the CAR T cell therapies, and so we have an opportunity to compare and contrast and think about it some more. So I thought it would be worthwhile for us now just to take a look at all these different CAR T therapy details that we heard about uh, here at ASH. And so I've just highlighted here some of the concepts that we heard discussed. And so abstract number 955. This is the follow-up of the Chinese study and we will get into a little bit of detail about that. I think that that was a top priority trial here. Many people interested in that. But some of the other interesting uh, aspects uh, a fully humanized CAR T uh, uh, product. This has the advantage of the potential for safe, safely administering repeated therapy which yeah. if that's the way forward that could, could be useful. Uh, the aloe CAR T is a CAR T that is potentially off the shelf. Is that something that could end up being useful? We don't know. Uh, most of these uh, CAR Ts right now are focused on BCMA, but there are other targets. One could consider using multiple targets, and uh, as you know, some, some protocols are a combination CD19 and BCMA. Uh, and so there are many, many ideas about strategies. Uh, even uh, the idea of the EGFR safety switch, I think, which is kind of a, a cool approach, uh, uh, the ability to shut off the CAR T cells if there's a, a, a adverse uh, uh, side effects occurring. So all of these very, very interesting aspects for CAR T therapy. And so 
th this is really the, the abstract that people wanted to, <laughs> to hear the update. And so this is the, this is the so-called legend trial, uh, which is uh, from, from China. And uh, what we were hearing here at ASH is a follow-up of what we had heard at uh, ASCO uh, last year, uh, uh, when this was really a very unexpected and exciting study that was presented uh, for the first time there. And so uh, this is a particular type of uh, CAR-T. Uh, I would draw your attention on, on this cartoon here to uh, the fact that this CAR-T uh, has a double uh, a head so that there is a double uh, attachment uh, to the myeloma and some would say that this is possibly a basis for uh, potentially better efficacy uh, and certainly this is what's proposed by, uh, by this Chinese team. Uh, what we uh, heard results from today uh, were results uh, from uh, w one of the centers. Now this uh, product has been tested at four sites in China as you can see here listed. Uh, and uh, has been presented before. Uh, the results for 57 patients treated at one of the sites was what we heard uh, presented uh, here at ASH. And so uh, this is what uh, you saw, and I'll just uh, summarize for our audience to see, well, what was it that we saw? Well, we saw some pretty striking results. 88% uh, uh, overall response rate, meaning uh, at least uh, a, a partial response, a 50% regression. But on your left, with the, with the green bars, you will see uh, MRD negative, 74% uh, complete remission, 68% uh, MRD negative. So very, very high level of deep responses. Over on your right, you will see that the best uh, response was not strikingly related to dose in this study. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was interesting to see, nor was it particularly r related to the BCMA expression that was studied. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, I'm sorry, we seem to have lost uh, the, the slides here for a moment. Uh, but we, we can, can we can continue yeah. to talk. But uh, as they as they fix the slides, so so this was the, um, the the results that we that we saw today. And so what I was about to show you is what we had seen previously, which was the results with the BB two one two one that were presented at uh, ASCO this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that the results with those I would say were uh, somewhat comparable or maybe a little bit less in terms of the response rate, which was in the 70s, and then also uh, the, um, the median duration of remission, uh, which was 11.8 months. Uh, what was about to show you here uh, for the LEGEND trial was that the overall median progression-free survival was, was 15, 15 months yeah. mm -hmm. versus 11. And, but for MRD negative, the median uh, progression free for survival was actually uh, 22 months, which was actually rather good. And then the overall survival at one year was 94% uh, actually. And so uh, the remission duration uh, and the survival uh, was, uh, was really quite impressive with the legend data. So here we see uh, the progression free survival, as I said, 15 months overall, uh, and then uh, 24 months for the MRD negative. And then if we look at the overall survival, overall survival 12 months overall, and uh, not reached uh, for the patients in the MRD negative status. And so really pretty impressive. And then uh, I show you here the, the, the results with the, uh, the cell gene uh, product, uh, the BB2121, uh, with the 11.8 month uh, median PFS. Uh, and so uh, both are quite good. I, I, I would uh, point out something that, that you guys are aware of, which is that there is a difference in the patient populations. Yeah. Uh, in the LEGEND trial, it was clear that the patients had fewer prior therapies, more in the three to four range possibly, whereas in this uh, BB212 trial, obviously extensively previously treated with a median number of cycles of over six, so yeah. that there's, there's definitely that difference in the patient population to consider. So uh, I, would, I would like to hear what we all think really about 
about these therapies, those two that we've just looked at would be considered the, the lead candidates in terms of potential approval. Uh, uh, but uh, wh what do we think about that? Is that the case? Do we think that those one or both of those might be approved? Uh, but with all of these new alternatives, um, where is CAR-T therapy headed? I mean, uh, th those might be approved, but uh, will there be new iterations that really end up being uh, products that we will be using for the future? So, so maybe, uh, Joe, you could comment sure. first on this. <clears throat> Absolutely. I, I mean, first of all, I agree with you, Brian. I mean, these are very impressive results. I mean, these are patients who right now, at least as we knew from uh, the BB2121 study, who really had no other options left to them. Uh, who have that response rate. You're right, I think with the LCAR study that we see from China now, despite the caveats of there only being one site represented and, and it needs to be confirmed, they, they are a bit earlier stage patients, but that's impressive. 88% response, you know, two thirds of, over two thirds of patients going into MRD negativity. So I think this is real. I think it, it's showing us the signal that this is a unique way to, to take down myeloma. Um, that being said, I agree with you that, you know, if we want to stretch the car analogy, you know, we've got the, a great model car, but there are a whole lot of other uh, benefits that we can add to this car, adding the sunroof and the stereo system and so on. <laughs> I think what we're seeing are so many of these new advances that are probably going to make car T's a little bit more effective and more safe at the same time. Right. Um, so I'm not sure that these will be the final iterations that will go for uh, approval, or perhaps they'll go for approval and there'll be subsequent ones, but I think there is more work. When I look at even just the last year and a half, how much safer CAR T cell therapy, therapy has become and how much more effective we're seeing right. it, I think we've probably done the major manipulations, but there's still a little bit more to do. Right, so, so how does this strike you, Marvi? Yeah, no, I completely agree, and I think that uh, so both maybe right now are the lead candidates to be approved. Yes. But uh, I would say that this is the starting point to generate uh, new CAR T cells because yes. so in these uh, studies, so the T lymphocytes were not selected. The next step, and we have right. new CAR T cells in which so we are going to select uh, central memory T cells in yes. order to increase the persistence of the T cells. That Correct. I think that is incredible. But uh, so anyway, I think that uh, the results uh, presented uh, in both CAR T cells, I think that are really impressive. A bit better for legend, but the patients, I think, that are completely different. Right. And uh, maybe in more developed countries, the patient population that we see every day candidates to CAR T, I think that uh, are more consistent with uh, the BB2121, yes. exposed and refractory to first and second generation proteasome inhibitory meds, and also right. to daratumumab. In China, the presenter said that, that daratumumab is not available, so right. the patient population is different, Clearly but I different, think that yes. if we put together the data of both studies, so mm -hmm. I think that uh, the results uh, are impressive because so we are dealing with a patient population in which so with the newer agents that the median progression free survival was not superior f to four months and okay. now we are seeing here median progression free survivals over one year so yeah I so this is really an yeah. impressive difference uh, i think se that, several yeah. fold better mm -hmm. than we've Absolutely. seen with other therapies and you know there have been that concern earlier on that maybe some of the car t cells will will work and give it deep response, but then not persist. Yes, but, but now I think we're seeing that. We're I mean, seeing to go persistence. over a year and now 15 months, I think it's it's the proof of concept. It, we can do right. this, we can manipulate these cells, we can provide this, uh, but I completely agree with Marie V. I think it's really a starting point. It's by no means the end. Uh, what one development that people discuss is uh, maybe it could be better if the cells are harvested earlier in the disease. So for the future, uh, moving forward, uh, CAR T cells, well, the, the T cells could be harvested harvest it at an earlier point so that they would be in better shape for the engineering later. Yeah, this is an interesting approach because in fact we know that when we use the T lymphocyte at the late advanced stage of the disease, the immune system is uh, less preserved and so is more exhausted. So I think that is uh, an excellent option as well as, uh, as you mentioned, the allocarty. Yes. This is another possibility, and so I think that definitely this is just a starting point, and so I think that we'll, we'll see new generations and new modalities of CAR Ts. Right, right. Okay, very good. So um, uh, two very important uh, immunotherapy approaches, uh, quite promising for sure. Yeah. 
So uh, we're going to move on to what we had here at ASH, which were, uh, I think, uh, two important updates on frontline therapy. Uh, first, uh, the updates on the SWOG 777 trial, which I had the honor to present the follow-up on that. And then I think what was quite exciting for everyone was the first uh, results from the, uh, the so-called the MIAS trial, the uh, daratuma, daratumumab Revdex versus uh, Revdex, uh, uh, the full results of which it will be presented as a late-breaking abstract tomorrow, actually. And so we just have what was in the abstract that we can give to you today. And then a small abstract that was presented about what what is the uh, impact of the presence of the uh, 1114 translocation in the frontline setting. So if we go through the two uh, trials first, uh, the update on the on the SWOG trial, it included uh, uh, an update on all of the response evaluation as well as the endpoints of PFS and survival. And so uh, I would draw your attention just to the percentages here so we can be thinking about the comparison of these numbers with what we're seeing in the Maya trial. So you can see here uh, about a 75% VGPR or better, overall response rate 90%, and then in the RD arm, 53% uh, and 78% there. Okay, so clearly a, a benefit for the VRD, and this is evident in the uh, PFS numbers, the, the remission duration here, here which the numbers, it's very interesting with uh, seven years of follow-up now, uh, the numbers are very, very similar, uh, 29 months for RD versus 41 months for the VRD. And then the overall survival, I think what is quite impressive with the, with, the, with the VRD is we have still not reached the median in terms of overall survival for the VRD. 55% of these patients are still alive at seven years. Uh, so uh, really, uh, Pretty impressive uh, to see what is the impact of six months of early therapy. So I think that it's quite a strong proof of principle that uh, early intervention, the fast uh, uh, response, uh, can have a prolonged uh, impact. Uh, and so this is uh, the impact of age. And so this uh, study did include uh, patients up to the age beyond 75. And you can see here that there was a benefit of the triple therapy, BRD versus RD. Uh, but you can see here the, uh, the decrease in outcome with RD is particularly over the age of 75, but a clear benefit in each er age group. And so I think that this is, uh, again, uh, if feasible, uh, a support for the, the notion of using a triple therapy or, or, or some kind of a combination uh, in the older patient. And so what about uh, the late-breaking abstract? What about uh, the impact of DARA, uh, lenalidomide uh, DEX, uh, DRD versus the lenalidomide DEX? And so we had the privilege of hearing about that at our interna International Myeloma Working Group breakfast. Uh, to, to hear some details. Uh, and so uh, the results are, are really uh, quite promising, showing uh, uh, an improved progression-free survival uh, with the three-drug combination, the daratumumab Revdex versus the Revdex. I would also draw your attention, though, to the uh, median uh, uh, PFS with RD, uh, 31.9 months in this trial, so it's uh, uh, helpful to make note of that. Uh, and then for the comparisons, I think it's also interesting to see here uh, VGP are better. You can see here 79%, so actually, actually very similar to the uh, VRD. And then also quite similar, the RD 53%, which is very similar to what we saw in the SWOG trial, actually. So uh, very, very interesting to see that. And, uh, and uh, Mary V, you, you'll be interested in the last comment there. I think that, uh, that uh, your trial with the DARA VMP uh, plus this trial clearly uh, support the notion of the value of, of daratumumab in the frontline setting. Uh, now, uh, 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 an interesting uh, kind of a sidelight uh, was a study coming from the Emory team where they studied over a thousand patients with VRD, where they drew attention to the fact that in their experience, uh, patients with the 1114 uh, didn't do quite as well. So. We, we tend to think of that as a, as a favorable group, but maybe it's more 
intermediate risk uh, than we had been thinking. And so uh, I've, I've, I've put together some, some questions for our uh, illustrious team here. Yeah. Uh, what do we see for the future of Frontline? And uh, I think that the fact that I'm using all of these bullets suggests that we're not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, I don't know who would like to go first in selecting the, the quadruplets, the, uh, the triplets, or what, what you might think uh, the future holds for uh, frontline therapy. Do you want to go first, uh, Marie V? Well, I think <laughs> that uh, the situation is uh, actually challenging because yes. so we have a, a lot of new combinations, uh, three drug-based combination, maybe in the future four drug-based combination, so with uh, clearly very attractive results. Uh, so I think that your VRD study, the update of the SWOG study, showed the consolidated results uh, with VRD. And the median follow-up uh, is uh, very long. And I think that this is an important thing for all the studies, because now we are observing more and more very interesting trials, but with a median follow-up uh, very short. Yes. We need uh, to evaluate the trials with longer follow-up. So I think that there is not any doubt about uh, the role of VRD as the standard of care in newly diagnosed myeloma patients, yes. both transplant and non-transplant right. eligible, because in your study, so you have uh, analyzed and presented during this Congress the sub-analysis according to the age, yes. and I think that uh, the results uh, with a longer follow-up uh, confirm the benefit of VRD followed by RD in terms of both progression-free survival and overall survival. And uh, so we are going to have a VRD, and we are going to evaluate if the addition of direct mumab is going to result into a significant benefit. That the answer is maybe yes, and so phase three randomized trial are going to start in order to answer to this question. Right. In the meantime, so we can potentially add direct mumab to, I would say, two standards of care. VMP, that I know that it is not a very commonly used here in the US, but right. so it's a standard of care in Europe yeah, yeah. and in other countries in which so yeah. the affordability yeah. for Lendesi so is not uh, available and, and it's uh, not and clear. And the other benefit was quite clear. Yeah, and so it is possible to add data to VMP and also the Alcyon study has been updated during this Congress and with one year of additional follow-up, uh, again, I think that uh, the benefit in terms of progression-free survival is uh, confirmed, and in fact, so for me, it's interesting to see how when patients receive data single agent as maintenance, and so the PFS is sustained and really few yes. patients progressed and are dead. But of course, so we are going to, to hear tomorrow early in the morning the late breaking abstract based on Lendex plus data. And I think that uh, the results are impressive, uh, but uh, impressive if we start by the control arm, because uh, the median progression free survival is 32 months, so right. longer than expected if we consider the first study yes. or the control arm in the SWOG study. Right. The hazard ratio is uh, so it's very low, and so we can expect a median progression free survival of approximately maybe five years in the mm -hmm. Afron setting for elderly patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. So I think that we are going to have a new standards of care. Today, I think that uh, I would like to confirm that VRD is a standard of care that we can use. In the future, maybe KRD, and I know that here in the US, KRD is sometimes used mm -hmm. for patients with high, high risk. risk. Yes. And so there are some trials, some random, uh, randomized trials currently ongoing that uh, are going to compare VRD, VRD with KRD. KRD, yes, the endurance is going on. Exactly. Right? Yes. So, so what do you think, Joe? Yeah, no, I, actually, I agree very much with Mali I, I mean, I think I would look at it as a stepwise, as you've said. In the short term, it's confirming the use of monoclonal antibodies up front. It confirms triplets are still the standard of care. I don't think we're quite yet ready to suggest a quadruplet. I, I sort of look at it because this is so similar to your SWOG study, Brian, right. and the depths of response. I completely agree with Mali V. We need time. But it's a little unlikely that we're going to see a massive difference over time. So I, I try to think of it simplistically and say, well, we have proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, and monoclonal antibodies as the three novel parts of what we use along, obviously, with steroids and sometimes with melphalan. And now I think we have legitimate grounds to say 
It could be VRD, where you take a proteasome inhibitor right. or an image, but it could also be v a monoclonal antibody. Or, 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 or VBD. You know, the study, uh, yeah, studies are going. It sort of feels like Castor and Pollux in the front line, right? It is. Where, yeah. Where yeah, we, we like the confusion, is. right? We want there to be choice. This is better for patients because yeah. right. I can think immediately in my clinic of patients who I'm going to say, you know, the DRD regimen is, mm -hmm. is really attractive or, or, or maybe VRD is a little bit more attractive. One other comment though, Brian, I think is important. When we do start looking in the longer term, one of the fundamental differences between this study and almost any other study that's been done in transplant ineligible patients is that both novel drugs, as it were, the monoclonal antibody mm -hmm. and the immunomodulatory well, drug, okay. Are continued, yes, yeah. yes. So yes. in your SWOG study, the yeah. bortezomib was stopped after about eight yeah. cycles. Of necessity, I mean, you, have to, you have to stop it. Right? Yeah. In, in your in uh, Alcyon study, the same. Same. Same he goes thing. for not really much more than a year. So this is one that, that may well have that long-term benefit by virtue of keeping patients on both of those, yeah, assuming so the, it's feasible. The, 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 and, and we learned from, yes. uh, from using in the relapse setting, that combination is feasible in the long run. Right, and, and that ability to have the longer exposure is, is quite important to, to get the benefit, yes. So I don't know if you want to comment on the, we, we can maybe discuss later. Uh, so uh, do, do you see uh, possibly a role of, of the nidoclax earlier in the disease? Obviously we've been studying it in the, in the relapse setting, but uh, do you think that there would be a possibility of more of a precision approach? Do you see any early use of uh, the nidoclax or maybe not? I think so. Maybe? So, yeah, maybe we have uh, right now the results of a venetoclax uh, single agent or in combination with yes. dexamethasone in relapse and refractory myeloma patients. And so it's effective uh, in patients with 11-14 uh, translocation. I think that uh, we are going to see maybe next year the results of the randomized study comparing VD versus venetoclax plus VD, in mm -hmm. which so not only patients with a translocation 1114, 1114 are going to be included. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, these results will be key in order to know if we can use venetoclax only in patients with 1114 translocation or Across in a more broad, wide a population. Broader, broader population. But anyway, yeah. I think that it represents the first option of targeted therapy. So, right. and according to the results that uh, you have sold uh, coming from the Emory in uh, more than 1,000 patients, yes. so I think that uh, we consider the 1114 translocation as a uh, standard risk uh, translocation, cytogenetic abnormality, and maybe it's not so standard, yes. and it mm -hmm. would be, I would say, intermediate uh, yeah, risk yeah. cytogenetic abnormality and so I think that why not if we can target uh, this uh, cytogenetic right. abnormality with uh, an oral drug like venetoclas I think that we have to prove of course that uh, the drug is working and uh, the drug is safe but so I see that could, uh, could, could, be, could, could be an option yes yeah. yes I think because of time we might uh, need to cycle back uh, and see uh, about the potential role of CAR T and, and bites in the earlier disease, but uh, uh, probably a little bit uh, early to be talking about that, yeah. but maybe something for the future. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, interesting information uh, about maintenance of this meeting, and so uh, two uh, quite, 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 quite useful um, uh, abstracts were presented, uh, exazomib, uh, the oral proteasome inhibitor for maintenance, and then an interesting study looking at what happens if you stop giving the DEX along with Revlimid uh, in, in the maintenance se setting. So if we just look at the what's called the tourmaline trial, MM3, this is the use of the oral, oral proteasome inhibitor exazomib, uh, and in this case, uh, following autologous stem cell tra transplant in patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. And so in this particular setting, this was presented by uh, Dr. Demopoulos from, uh, from Greece. And so uh, fairly uh, clear results uh, where there was a, a, a benefit, uh, a prolongation, 39% uh, improvement in the PFS with the ixazomib uh, versus placebo. Uh, I think in terms of the absolute number of months, uh, we have 26.5 months versus 21.3 months. So. Uh, n not a, a huge extension, but certainly uh, statistically uh, significant. And so uh, people were, were interested and paying attention to that for sure. And then there was actually quite a lot of discussion about this abstract, abstract number 305, where uh, in the elderly and intermediate fit patients, uh, 
there was a, a protocol to see if stopping the dexamethasone in the maintenance phase would have a negative impact on the uh, progression of breast survival and, and the outcome. And so people are quite interested to see uh, this data and it's, it's a unique area for study actually. We haven't seen this before. And so it was designed uh, to look at uh, this elderly intermediate fit patient, patient population and the standard RD uh, versus uh, stopping the D in the maintenance phase. And so uh, results uh, uh, fairly uh, clear cut that actually uh, the RD switching to R had uh, actually uh, a little bit better event free survival. So there was not, not a negative impact, yeah. uh, even a positive impact. And so I think that people really uh, were interested in that. And that's, I think, why people uh, were, were uh, paying attention to this. And so it, it just drew attention to kind of where are we with maintenance? These are a couple of new uh, nuances uh, to, to what we have available in our armamentarium. Obviously, we have uh, meta-analysis data uh, for the use of lenalidomide or revlimid in maintenance. So now we have uh, these data on exazomib and information about dexamethasone. Uh, so maybe, uh, Joe, you might want to comment sure. first because yeah. I know that you were involved with the assessment of lenalidomide. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think it's great. We want more options. I mean, this is always a theme, right? We want more options, and I think uh, Ixazimib is, is entering the market that way as, and will likely be an option for us. I, I have to say that I still think lenalidomide maintenance for probably the lion's share of, of patients is still the standard of care. Uh, the absolute benefit of Ixazimib over placebo was, was not as much as we would have liked it to be. Perhaps not too shocking based on the drug, but it, it, but it does validate that because I look at two groups of patients who right now, lenalidomide maintenance is really not ideal. Mm -hmm. Almost at two, two different ends of the spectrum. One, those patients who for whatever reason unfortunately can't tolerate it or maybe in their induction phase were resistant to it. Um, you know, even in the meta-analyses of lenalidomide maintenance, there are you know, between 25 to 30 percent of patients who have to come off the drug for some kind of side effect or, or, or adverse event. So, so there's that group of patients where we want to give them something, and now at least we have better evidence to use something like exazomib. Historically, we've been using bortezomib without, without having a tremendous amount of evidence. The other extreme are those patients who we wonder if LEN maintenance is enough, the mm -hmm. high-risk patient. Yeah. Right. Um, and not that this was this study to prove no, that, but, but, but this may give us at least a little bit more incremental evidence of saying, well, if ixazomib works and lenalidomide works, right. maybe in this group we can combine them together. Right, there was a lot of discussion about that, but we don't really have those data from this. Right, and my last comment about the RD to R concept. Yes. Um, actually, I found this really, it's a real world fantastic study. I mean, it's something that I have to confess, I have been doing a lot already. Yeah. I sometimes describe to my patients that dexamethasone are like the booster rockets on the shuttle, you know? They really help that initial response, but eventually we want them to fall off because longer term dexamethasone is hard on patients yeah. and Not induces sugar. all sorts of side yeah. effects. Blood and, sugar, and blood uh, sugar uh, hypertension, uh, cataracts, yeah. bone disease, I mean, there's lots of things that can come with it. So this was kind of nice to have that, if you will, validated. So I think this is good for patients. I think the fact that less drug comes yes. to a better response, a better right. outcome is, is always something we like to see. And this way, I think the dexamethasone can be, if not completely discontinued, at least significantly reduced, knowing that we're still giving you know, right, a, right. a good approach to our patients. Yeah, yes. and, and in fact, so this is, I think, that a, a very clear message that so can impact in our clinical practice tomorrow. Yes. Because so mm -hmm. we are going to see patients in which so we were prescribing lenalidomide plus dexamethasone yes. as continuous therapy, and we can immediately stop uh, dexamethasone. Yes. I think that uh, the patients are going to get a significant benefit because, in fact, in the trial, the event-free survival included as event the development of hematological or non-hematological toxicity. That this is yes. something that we don't see usually in the clinical trial. Right. So they really evaluated the impact of uh, mm -hmm. continuous high-dose lenalidomide together with dexamethasone in the event-free survival. Yeah, so very, very, very important. So we've actually gone from four-day pulses to once a week to zero. Yeah. <laughs> That's good um, for patients. Right? Which is yeah. great. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think that this is a very positive message for, for patients. Yeah.
All right, so, so, so let's move on here. Uh, so th this is something that uh, we thought was particularly interesting because it's uh, uh, a new way of uh, thinking ab about the biology of, of myeloma. And uh, one of your colleagues from uh, Spain, uh, Bruno Paiva, uh, presented, uh, there's actually a couple of related abstracts from the team that, that looked at um, uh, circulating myeloma cells. And so, so the first uh, abstract uh, was one which was looking at the expression profiling and, and actually a, a variety of aspects of circulating myeloma cells, which uh, are called CTC, circulating uh, tumor cells. And so uh, this was a very interesting study looking at the characteristics of cells that are present in the blood of patients with myeloma. And so uh, ju just this, uh, this uh, concept here of the, the idea of a primary tumor and then uh, cells with a tendency to, um, uh, to spread, entering the circulation, and then reseeding elsewhere. And uh, so I think it's a very, very interesting question, uh, uh, what, what could happen with possibly a relatively small number of cells which have this capacity, but then reseed and create uh, new lesions in, in another spot. And so without going, going into the, all the details, uh, it it's, turns out to be relatively easy in the blood to distinguish uh, the, 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 the CTCs uh, and also to compare the pattern with the bone marrow uh, plasma cells uh, as a reference. And so the, the summary is that uh, looking at gene expression profiling, uh, the, the, the pattern is very similar between bone marrow and blood mm -hmm. with a few exceptions. Uh, genes involving interferon, inflammatory response, hypoxia, cell cycle, and particularly the tendency for migration which is reflected by the presence of the CD44 uh, on the surface. And so uh, very interesting uh, aspect, a new way to be uh, thinking about uh, myeloma and, and the progression and aggressive pattern of the disease potentially. And so it raises uh, maybe a broader topic. Uh, so here you can study the myeloma in the blood and, and, and assess what's going on. But we also have new data that uh, using uh, mass spec to study the uh, M component in the blood at a much, much more sensitive level, maybe uh, two or three thousand fold more sensitive than uh, SPEP and immunofixation. And then we also have new data looking at uh, circulating uh, DNA and RNA where uh, the presence of mutations can be studied. And so uh, I think it's, it's interesting to consider uh, the next question which I have for you, uh, which maybe Maravi you could comment on first because it's something that you have available to you uh, in Spain, uh, the, the monitoring uh, with, with the cells in the blood and, and uh, wh wh what do you feel the future holds for that? Yeah, so I think that uh, right now, so we have to consider all these assessment in research because so I think that the data are not uh, well consolidated yet, but so I think in the future, I think that will be very useful because so if we can potentially monitor the disease just in the peripheral blood and uh, we would need only to go to the bone marrow at the moment of diagnosis and during the follow-up it would be possible to analyze just uh, the blood and uh, to utilize according to the circulating tumor cells maybe specific transcriptomes of specific cells that can be used as biomarkers predicting yes disease progression. The same if we consider, if we use maybe together the circulating tumor cells with the mass spectrometry, See? a more sensitive assessment, and uh, in addition we can use even genomic uh, assessment to evaluate uh, the plasma cells into the peripheral blood. So uh, at the end I think that uh, we are going to have a very sensitive assessment to evaluate uh, the peripheral blood and to evaluate the disease from the minimal residual disease point of view, you. as well as also as uh, potential biomarkers that can predict uh, progression, early progression, and maybe if we go beyond, so in the near, in the, not in the near the future, future, maybe in the long future, future, maybe early intervention as soon uh, as yes. we detect uh, just uh, using uh. Assessments yes, in the a, a new type blood. of a biochemical exactly, relapse exactly. To, to, for early intervention. Yes, yes. So, so how does this strike you, uh, Joe? No, very similarly. I mean, this is great news. I mean, hopefully it could mean ultimately we'll do fewer marrows. I mean, I think we still need that baseline marrow right. for sure up front, but in terms of regular follow-up, 
You know, we're starting to learn that myeloma is a, even this migration that was demonstrated, uh -huh. myeloma is a challenging disease. Sometimes yeah. it will migrate a lot more than others. So I think it's giving us more tools in the toolbox and, and any, any individual patient will have to see what is the best way to follow patients. Some patients we still need imaging because right. they have extra medullary disease, yeah. but this may capture some of those. You yeah, know, so. I, I'm the, the, the science that, you know, the geek in me loves this science. <laughs> yes. I mean, this, is, this is fantastic. But I think it actually has practical relevance in the not so distant future. Uh, the mass spec in particular, yeah. um, you know, we struggle so often with M spikes in the lab, uh, with especially patients with IgA myeloma. Immunofixation that is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we look in the lab, we sort of thumb it and say, yeah, I think yeah. it's about this big. Yeah, it's it's like so it. much more precise. We can actually know uh, now with monoclonal antibodies being used, we can know which is right. the spike from the antibody uh, and not. And also we can look back and say, was this the same disease that someone had before with yeah. more clonal evolution? Absolutely. So actually, I think mass spec of these methods that you've listed, yeah. Brian, is probably going to be the first one that's going to make it to the clinic. Correct. But with time, this circulating DNA concept, I think, is really going to be uh, much more valuable mm -hmm. to us. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, next year's ASH, I think that we will Correct. have data on the yeah. mass spec. Okay. Correct. Yeah, so I think that uh, this, could be, this could be good. All right, so uh, there were a number of abstracts uh, that were presented this year. We're analyzing patients who have had long survival, and so uh, it's interesting to understand. So in the first broad perspective, is, is this linked to the uh, MRD negative? In other words, uh, do all the patients who have a long survival, are they MRD negative, or maybe some are MRD positive and doing just well? Uh, and so, so it was interesting to see several studies and uh, one from the Mayo Clinic uh, where I show the data here, uh, they broke the patients into a number of different groups and uh, they uh, were able to show that patients who had been in continuous remission uh, for over four years without having ever had a relapse, they have the best survival uh, and uh, this could be with con ongoing continuous therapy or even uh, off therapy. If there had ever been a relapse, then those are the, the lower curves here. Uh, and so a couple of other abstracts looked at other uh, aspects of how could you predict which sort of a patient might have a long survival. Uh, uh, actually, the Spanish team again were correlating with the presence of the MNOS signature, which uh, can be an indicator of, of longer survival. And uh, so to kind of put this in perspective, there's, there's a paper just recently published from our IMWG where uh, the baseline, I think that we, we tend to, to forget that the baseline for long survival even out to 20 years is, is not zero. Yeah, which <laughs> uh, <but> is good. <laughs> it, which is very good. The starting point is not zero. It's, it's a little less than 15 percent. And, and so uh, we, we are starting. Uh, with that and uh, with, with the newer therapies we're expecting that number to go up uh, sequentially uh, and it could be with MRD negativity or, or maybe not always with MRD negativity. Yeah. One other abstract showed that uh, obviously the likelihood of long survival is linked to a, a lower age, the absence of low platelets, uh, CR after stem cell is obviously very good and as you might expect, the use of the more novel agents and especially maintenance uh, uh, is an important aspect. And so uh, uh, w we need to be thinking about where are we in terms of functionally curing or, or really getting to this point where, where patients can really uh, live a long time. Uh, uh, are we starting to have some aspect of cure in myeloma moving up above the 15% uh, level? So uh, obviously, um, Mary V, you, you have the initial results with your CSER trial in the high-risk smoldering setting. Uh, and so, so what, what do you think uh, is the status right now? So I think that in order to increase this 14.37% uh, of <laughs> yes, patients yes. potentially cured, I think that uh, beyond these patients with the long remissions, I think that uh, we can potentially increase early detection and early treatment. And as you mentioned, in our CESAR trial, so we planned an active therapy for high risk smoldering myeloma patients. And uh, the objective is uh, to cure patients. Yes. And uh, so we planned the definition of cure as uh, sustained minimal residual disease negative at five years. 
Of course, uh, the median follow-up now is uh, short mm -hmm. at the present time, and we have to wait. But uh, so we we can have positive results, and in fact, so all of all, all patients included in the study had already completed the induction, the transplant, and the consolidation. And 55% of patients after transplant went in minimal residual disease negative. Yes. And we are going to evaluate right now the proportion of patients in MRD negative after consolidation. And most patients are now in the maintenance phase. So I think that uh, we, you are going to complement our study with the yes, ASCENT and the study. And, yes. and we will see. But also, I think that uh, beyond these long remissions, I think that uh, there are patients in minimal residual disease negative, and I think that MRD negative is a good surrogate marker predicting progression-free survival and overall survival, but uh, not all patients achieve uh, MRD but negative, and there are some patients that are long survivors in spite of the minimal residual disease is not negative, and I think that uh, in these patients the immune profiling is critical, yes. because uh, I think that these patients can potentially have a, what I can say a positive immune profiling that uh, is able to control the disease, uh, although the clone, the tumor clone is present, so a good uh, immune system is able to control the disease. Absolutely. So, and I think that uh, these uh, three pillars so would be responsible for achieving more patients potentially cured. Absolutely. Early treatment, MRD negative, and if the MRD is not negative, immune profiling and to try to maintain the immune, immune system, system stimulators. Yes, yeah. yes. So I think these are the key points. Uh, and I think, and Joe, we, we're going to have to move on. And uh, you could comment on some similar aspects in this next uh, final segment here. But I think that, uh, yeah, these are really key points in terms of uh, how, how we stand in, in attempting to, to cure patients right now. And uh, you're interested in the CSER trial, and we're certainly interested in the outcome on the ASCENT trial. Absolutely. Uh, and so, in, in the assessment of MRD, uh, it be, has been quite interesting to see uh, what has been the longer term outcomes uh, with these combinations that we've been talking about, DRD and DVD, uh, in the relapse setting, the Castor and the Pollux uh, trials that were quite exciting data at last ASH and the ASH before. Uh, and so, at this ASH, what we have is the longer term follow up of these patients. And so what I think was quite interesting for me, I'll be interested in your, in your thoughts, was that patients who had MRD negativity at six months uh, in the Pollux study, for example, uh, DRD, uh, you can see at the top there, uh, sustained MRD negative, doing very, very well in terms of PFS and overall survival. And then uh, similarly for uh, the DARA Velcade uh, DEX, uh, MRD uh, negative at 12 months. Uh, for both of them, six months and 12 months, quite impressive in terms of sustained uh, uh, benefit in, in uh, remission and overall survival. And so it really uh, puts the question strongly, should we really be attempting to achieve that in the relapse setting? And so Joe, maybe, you, you can comment first on this part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it fits with what Marie-V has said. I mean, I think in general, depth of response correlates to duration. Yes. In, in, in uh, majority of myeloma patients, there are probably patients at, at either extreme in whom that does not apply. The very low risk, as you've almost described, that MGUS-like signature where the immune profile I mean, we have some very long-term survivors of myeloma who've actually never had a complete remission, let alone yeah. the MRD negative. But again, that's a pretty small fraction. Uh -huh. And similarly, the other end, some really high-risk patients who may transiently go into MRD negativity, and then it goes away. That's why I think this data was so important to show that a it's prolonged sustained. MRD negativity is going to be important. It really is yeah. what makes a difference. And yeah. I see us going in the, in the strategy that, that Marie V has sort of has described that even though we get very excited about risk stratification, it seems that that's just step one. So was patient high risk standard risk, but after they get treated, if they're in MRD negativity, um, we have maybe more comfort in not treating them as aggressively, but those MRD positive patients probably do need more. All if the therapy. Pro immune profiling is such as you've described it, they may need a different class of drug or a, a different yes. approach. Yes. And so I, maybe, I do maybe think the CAR T or the bites, uh, correct? Yeah, especially in the high stress patients. So I think that's we will probably get to a stage where we're saying 
that MRD negativity will influence your next step. If you're MRD negative, you know, if from, from the upfront setting, I know this is a relapse setting, you might say, okay, we'll go on to lenalidomide maintenance. You're still MRD positive, we're, right. you're gonna have a poor outcome, now is the time, time to, to say, jump in give in something and, like And, and do something estrogen. decisive, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and so, Concerning your specific question, I think that the MRD negative is also important at relapse. Upsetting. Not only in the upfront setting, because so now we have uh, combinations like in the Pollux, in the Castor, but other combinations yes. very effective at relapse, uh, and so patients uh, can achieve a complete response. So I think that it's important to evaluate uh, the quality of the response and uh, to evaluate uh, the minimal residual disease, because uh, so. We have had the opportunity to see the first time how the new criteria described by the International Myeloma Working Group sustained the minimum residual disease right. negative was evaluated in both Pollux and Castor right. and really sustained the MRD negative Is related with uh, so uh, flat sure. Absolutely. in terms of PFS. And, and these are actually the criteria uh, uh, summarized in the, in the new criteria. So, so this, this is tremendous T validation yeah. of, of that. So let's just uh, go to the, to the last point. So uh, hot topics that might have been missed. So I, uh, obviously there was some data on venetoclax, some, some follow-up on Selenexor, which I think will probably be the next uh, agent which is approved, FDA approved, probably based on the, the STORM trial, the Boston trial, some of the other combination trials. And a very new uh, drug, uh, Melflufen, uh, uh, where there was some early data, also some interesting data on Elopalm, which was actually recently published in, in the New England Journal. And so, so uh, the Melflufen was just interesting. It's a, it's a very unusual alkylating agent where some very preliminary data. So it's interesting to see a new agent that you haven't really been expecting, maybe showing some uh, interesting uh, results. Uh, so something just to be aware of uh, that it was producing some early benefit. Uh, but but really, um, are there any other topics that you think that were interesting or important that you that you heard this year, Mary V? You you're at the top of the list here. <laughs> so I think that we have uh, almost covered. I think that all aspects. Just uh, so mentioning the new agents that uh, you have showed in the previous slide, Selinexor is uh, important because so I think that is. Uh, a new agent with a different mechanism of action, action right. but I think that is uh, interesting and so it has demonstrated to be effective uh, single agent in combination with dexamethasone. And concerning malflufen, so I think that uh, we are now to treat our patients in the beginning without uh, alkylator mm -hmm. and uh, so maybe transplant for patients who receive autologous stem cell transplantation. And maybe we are going to recover new alkylator melflufen at the late advanced stage of the disease. Yes. And melflufen, so is a new alkylator. It has a different mechanism of action to the conventional melphalan. And it works in myeloma. Relapse and refractory myeloma patients, refractory to either pomalidomide and nor daratumumab. So heavily pretreated myeloma patients, mm. approximately 30% of the patients patient, responded. Yeah, said, yeah. And so I, I have a personal experience with this new agent that I can say that it works. Especially so I've seen dramatically response in patients with extramedullary disease. And in mm. fact, the performance status of the patient significantly improved just after the first infusion. Okay, so, so I think that it's uh, a new to watch agent. For sure. that, yes, that uh, we can maybe consider as a new agent that we can use uh, along right. the cures of the disease. And so any uh, uh, hot topics that you, <laughs> uh, that we haven't touched on? Well, very quickly, two things. Just yes. to emphasize that the cell and extra story as you've described. I mean, yes. I, think, I think we're seeing it, as you mentioned, in that single agent and the so-called penta-refractory patients right. have been exposed to almost everything. But it was encouraging to see its combination with daratumumab, with, with bortezomib. Yeah. So I think with time, it may yeah. be, as, as Marie V said, with a different mechanism of action. You look at that yeah. group that we described who go into MRD negativity, you may be able to hold them where they're at but those that are MRD positive, we need something different. W those patients are not gonna be cured with what we have right now right. alone, so, and, and we pursue so it. So that's interesting, yes. The, the other wild card may be yeah. completely a wild card, out, out, out of the box, Brian, but you, you know me, I have a particular interest in our communication with patients. Right. There were several studies that, and I think this is heralding more in the future, that looked at um, 
patient preferences yes. and, and how there's a huge variety of patient preferences. We need to know as a, as a physician, historically, what we thought was different than what nurses thought, which was different than what patients yeah. thought. Yes. So, so to learn their idea of what's more important to them in terms of frequency of administration or certain side effects yeah. that they look for. And then, of course, the communication piece. You know, we've right, seen right. this theme. Shared the shit. Absolutely, this thing absolutely. Yes. And then when the patient is included, yeah. um, they're more likely actually to be successful yeah. and yes. even effective it's a positive, survival. Very positive so, thing. So I'm, I'm happy to see those well, kinds of Well, I'm happy that we can, we can actually end on that note to, to involve the, the preference of the patient and that shared uh, decision-making uh, uh, process. So uh, really very, very important. Uh, to, to discuss uh, what do those things mean, but also to hear uh, what it uh, sounds like to the patient. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really uh, very, very uh, helpful. And so uh, for those of you uh, watching wherever you might be uh, here or, or, or in the future, we, we appreciate that. And so uh, thanks to uh, our guest this evening, uh, Maravie Mateus from Salamanca Thank Spain. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, Dr. Joseph McHale, uh, we're very pleased uh, to have, have had this chance and uh, uh, yet again we, we thank our sponsors uh, Celgene, Cariaform and Takeda Oncology and so uh, with that uh, uh, I'm happy to, to say good night, good, night uh, good evening uh, from here in uh, San Diego and uh, uh, I hope this had been uh, helpful and enjoyable so thank you all.